That you're here this morning. We're continuing our series. This is week three of the series we're calling Unstuck. And just kind of as way of review, this has really been a powerful series for us here this month at Cultivate Church. We really have seen God just start to transform people's hearts and minds. There's been people already, there's people learning to confess sin and get accountability in their life, and there's been people who've, whose relationships are changing, and God's molding people as they're realizing that God has principles in his word. It's alive, it's breathing, it's designed for him, for the word to change us and mold us. And it's been awesome to see people getting unstuck in their life. And today, uh, I want to talk with you, we're going to specifically be talking about marriage, okay? So let me give you a, already a heads up. We got some teenagers that just put the brakes on. We got some single folks who just said, I need to get out of here. Let me tell you, maybe you're not married yet. Maybe you still need these principles. <laughs> maybe you're, maybe you're uh, newly unmarried. You need these principles, okay? These, these are principles that we can apply to our, to our lives and our hearts in regarding relationships that God, God's way. Now, as a way of just a, a recap, Pastor Brandon kicked us off the series off a couple weeks ago, and he gave us some principles that I really want you to think through, really through the rest, the remainder of our time together this month. And I'll just, maybe you want to jot these down. You can listen to the message at cultivatechurch.tv. I'd, I'd encourage you to do that if you've missed any of them. But real quick, I just want to give you these thoughts, these ideas, so that you can be thinking through them and processing them as we go. Week one, he talked about three things that we need to do if we're going to really get unstuck. And they apply to everything that we do, every message that we're teaching. Number one is you need to get desperate. He said, you need to get desperate. You need to come to the point in your life where you're so tired of being stuck, you're so sick of the situation that you're in, that you're willing to do anything it takes to get unstuck. Now, if any of you have ever been stuck in real life, your car or somewhere, you, you, it's easy to get desperate when you get stuck and you need some help. You're willing to do whatever it takes. Ask anybody to help you. So you need to get desperate. Number two, you need to get a plan. Once I get to the point in my life where I'm desperate, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get unstuck in my life. I've got to get, develop a plan, and God's Word is a great place to go to develop that plan. There's principles all in God's Word to help us honor Him with our life. And then number three, he said, you need to get committed. And that's a tr that is such a true statement because once I get stuck, a lots of us have been unstuck before. Lots of us have gotten ourselves out of a situation, but we always seem to find ourselves back to where we came from because we really weren't committed to the process because it gets hard sometimes. And I love the verse. Our, our theme verse for the month is Psalm 40, verse 2. If you've got your notes, you can pull those out and we'll read together. It says, he lifted me out, God. He lifted me out of the ditch. He pulled me from deep mud. He stood me on a solid rock to make sure that I wouldn't slip. And the process that we're talking about this month is not that we would unstick ourselves, not that we would try the same thing that we've tried over and over again to get out of the situation or the things that we've gotten ourselves into, but that for once and for all, we would allow God to take care of the situations in our lives, that we would commit ourselves to him and we would get so committed to his process that whatever it took, God, I'm willing to do it. And the, pro and the, the, the reality of what happens when we do that is he puts us on a firm foundation on a solid rock so that we won't slip back into the stuff that we've gotten ourselves into in our lives. And then last week we talked about two principles in regards to addiction. How do I get out and get unstuck through addiction? And we uh, even applied his points to that message of getting committed and being sold out and desperate and getting a plan, and we said, if we're going to do it, we've got to figure out a way to turn to people, because God says, if you want healing in your life, you need accountability, and you need relationships in your life, and you need to get into a small group, and turn to people, and build relationships, and live life together, and then we need to turn to God, because God is the forgiver of our sins. He is the one that helps us through every situation in our life, and we talked about how we need to turn to people, and turn to God in every situation when we're stuck in addiction. Now, today, we're specifically talking about marriage. I looked up some jokes. I like jokes. I think I'm funnier sometimes than um, anybody else on the planet thinks I am. But I'm going to give you some jokes today. So we're going to lighten up the mood a little bit and just help me out. Let's just go ahead and give me a little, give me a little courtesy laugh right now. One, two, three. 
There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Just let me hear that. It makes me feel better when I'm preaching, okay? All right, number one, are you ready? Here's your joke. Married couple walks up to a wishing well. They're excited. They're, they're married, and they go to a wishing well. They're out on a date, and the wife throws in a quarter. She makes a wish, and the husband gets his quarter out. He walks up to the well, and he leans over a little bit too far, falls in the well, and dies. The wife goes. She backs up, and she goes, huh, it really works. There you go. That's that courtesy laugh. Come on. I love it. All right, I'll give, I'll give you one more. There's an engaged couple. So we got some, we got some people who aren't married yet, want to be married. They, they, come, they have a big fight. Anybody had a big fight before? Disagreement. They have this big fight, and she gets so fed up, and she's like, I ain't marrying this guy. And she tells him, she said, if you were my husband, I'd poison your coffee. And he said, if you were my wife, I'd drink your coffee. <laughs> give that one a little bit. It'll sink in. It, it'll, it'll, it'll get to you later. You'll be on your way home. You'll be like, ah, oh, I got it, I got it. <laughs> hey, specifically today, I want to share with you some principles. My wife and I met when we were young. People say, why did you date so long before you got married? Because we couldn't legally get married. We, got so, we married, so we dated so young. We were 15. I was 15. She was 16. Got me an older woman. She used to, we used to go on dates. We used to go on dates in the minivan. I remember those days. That was awesome. But, but we dated for a while, but we met when we were young, and we married when we were young. I was 21 years old when I got married, and... We have learned a lot of things over the nine years that we've been married. Now, some of you are in here, and you've been married significantly longer. And I would like to tell you today, I want to let you know up front, the, the things that I'm sharing with you today are the small amount of things that we've learned through God's Word and through living life together nine years as a married couple. Some of you have 40 principles, and I'm going to learn them as I go. <laughs> and the Bible says, victory is found in the counsel of many. And I will call you, and I will ask you lots of times, how do we get through this, and how do we do that because the Bible tells us we need to glean from that but I just want to share with you just four principles that we've learned that have helped us get unstuck in the seasons of our life this morning so if you've got notes maybe you can just write those down you're unmarried write these down these are principles you're going to need when you get married okay it's going to happen God's got a plan for your life and as you're looking to that and you're asking God for that season of your life already get ahead because we had to learn it the hard way <laughs> we had to learn some principles the hard way and I would like for you to be able to just smooth sail through these areas in, in your own life. So let's pray together and let's just open up God's word and learn. How do we get unstuck in our marriage? We're overboard. We don't know where to go, what to do. How do I fix that? Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. God, thank you that we... Um, we don't have to do life alone, and we're not stuck out here on an island. Or, God, we're not thrown overboard and trying to figure out all of what to do with nowhere to go. But the Bible teaches us that your word is God-breathed. And, Father, you have given us instruction and principles through your word so that we could live a life on purpose that honors you. God, in the single life, in the dating life, God, in our married life, there are principles that we can follow in your word, God, that will, that will prove true in our attempt to honor you with our lives and in our families. And, God, we pray that as we open up your word today, that our minds would be open. We would come today with an open mind and an open heart. And God, that you would speak to us. Some of us, maybe you would challenge some of us. You would convict maybe some of us to do things a little bit different. But Father, maybe you would even encourage some of us that we're going down the right path. We're making some good decisions in our marriage. And God, I just pray that you would be glorified. You would be honored. And God, we would leave here changed today. Not the same because we've met with you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So number one, some marriage lifelines. I'm overboard. We don't know what to do. We're sinking fast. Number one, you need to seek God. You need to seek God. I love the verse in Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. It says this, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, one of the biggest things that we do when we get married is even, even newlyweds, it's easy, easy, easy for us to put our spouse up on this pedestal in front of anything else in life. It's, we want to please them. We want to make sure that they're happy, and we want to make sure everything's going straight in our marriage because if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. So we try to find, our, we find ourselves in life trying to please one another above everything else. But the truth is, God has said, have no other God 
gods before me. And he's clear in his word that anything I put in front of him becomes my God. So many of us, as we get married, we're in uh, uh, the South and we're in uh, America, and a lot of us get this American dream kind of just infused into us, the the dream that we're going to get married and we're going to get rich and we're going to have the nice house and the cool dog and we're going to grow old and happy together and we're never going to have any problems and it's all going to be awesome, happily ever after. And that's what we begin to chase after. That's the dream that we begin to follow and that's the we make every decision based off of that dream and that hope and our job decisions and our, our family decisions and our relationship decisions and our friend, all of it's based on that dream. And the truth is we've allowed all of that kind of stuff to become our God. And God's saying, if you want all of that stuff, I think every family here, every person that's going to get married, I think everyone here would say, I want to have a successful family and I want I want us to make a lot of money and I want our kids to be healthy and I want our kids to go to great schools and I want us to be able to go on vacation a lot and I want us to be uh, comfortable in life. But the truth is, if that's what you want in your life, you can't seek after that stuff first. Listen to what God's word says in Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Come on, let's say that together. One, two, three, all. Let's say all one more time. One, two, three. All else, there's nothing else you can seek more. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Number one thing that we have to do as a family is we have to figure out a way to seek God and place him first. God is your number one. Your spouse is your number two. Everything else kind of falls in line after that. I studied, a, um, I found a, a, a study that Family Life magazine had done a few years ago as I was preparing for this message. And they did a study. They surveyed thousands of families, and they asked them one question. How often does your family pray together? Not how often do you pray individually or do you pray for your family, but how often do you get your spouse, your husband, or your wife, and you hold hands, and you find your place, and you specifically pray together. And they said that out of the thousands that they interviewed, less than 8% of them prayed together. But here's what they figured out. Out of all of the people that they, that they interviewed, they said that of the people that actually prayed together, less than 8%, of those families that prayed together, less than 1% of them ever divorced. Less than 1%. That blew my mind. It even convicted me to know that we, even as, as my family, we need to commit to pray together more. So in your notes, you can write that down. A principle that we've learned, if we're going to seek God more, we need to pray together. We need to pray together. Because the Bible teaches us, in James chapter 5, we even talked about it last week, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And can I say this, that a prayer of a family together, united to, as one, seeking God, is even, it's powerful and effective. It's that old cliche of a triangle. I used to, uh, when I went through marriage counseling years ago, well, nine years ago, it's not too far, but when we went through, they would show you the triangle, and you're on the left side, your wife's on the other side, and they say, as long as you, clo if you the closer you grow to God, the closer you're going to get to each other, and I thought that was so corny, but the truth is still there. It remains. If we seek God first, our relationship is going to be stronger. So number one, if I'm going to get unstuck, we have to commit to pray together, to seek God. And guys, let me tell you, it's going to be awkward. It'll be weird. The first time you pray together out loud with your spouse, you'll feel funny. But just, just persevere. Pray together. Pray together. Seek God together. If you, need, if you have a decision in your family, don't, don't say, well, I'll pray about it. You pray about it. Y'all come together. Pray together. Seek God's will together as a family. You'll be happy you did. Less than 1% divorced if they pray together. That's a huge statistic. So we just learned early on in our marriage that we're going to seek God. For better or worse, we're going to commit to seek God in our family. Number two, another principle that we learned kind of early on is we're going to believe the best. We're going to believe the best in one another. That's very easy not to do, especially in, in our culture. We're very cynical people. It seems like we all the time think somebody's out to get us or out to do us wrong or they really were malicious in the decisions that they made that hurt us or whatever. But the Bible tells us in James 1.19, he gives us these principles. He says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. He says, you must be all quick to listen, slow to speak, 
slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You know, many of us, most of us, at least me, I know this. It's true in my life. I like that verse, but I do it backwards. I'm always uh, quick to get angry. I'm quick to speak, and I am very slow to listen. Every man in here, is, you, whether you say you, you're that way or not, I know you're lying to me. You're just like me. We love to talk, and we, don't, and we love to get angry, but, man, we don't listen very well. And I learned early on that, you know what, I'm going to believe the best in my wife, and my wife believes the best in me. And I can tell you in over the past nine years, we have let each other down a bunch. There has been lots of things where we that have made each other angry or upset, and we have messed it up. But you know what? There's never been one time where I really felt like she was malicious or tried to really intentionally hurt me. Why? Because I choose to believe the best in her. I choose to believe she may have messed up or I may have messed up, but we have just made a decision that out of all of the ups and downs, the ins and outs of marriage, we're going to choose to believe the best in one another, and we're going to figure a way to work out our differences. And one way we found, if you want to write this down, is we have chose to listen to understand. Listen to understand. Now that was a hard lesson for us because we love to cut each other off when we disagree. Does anybody else do that? You're trying to talk, you're trying to get your point across, and they love to just respond before you can ever get it out of your mouth, and you're like, can I, can I finish? <laughs> can I finish what I'm going to say? You're going to listen to what I've got to say? So we learned a principle that we're going to start listening to understand. We're gonna, it's called actively listening. And it's corny, and it's weird sometimes, but we've gotten used to it. If we're in a disagreement, we say this all of the time. We will let them finish, and we will say this. What I heard you say was, and then we will respond. Was that true or was that false? Because we, we, we were in the process of already assuming what they were going to say, and we were always wrong. That's not what I was going to say at all. And then, you're, then you find yourself in a 45-minute argument over tones of voice and what you thought they meant to begin with, and you never can even address the problem because you're fighting. You're already three fights down, <laughs> and you're trying to figure out what, what in the world were we even arguing about to begin with because we didn't listen to understand. We were listening to judge. We were trying our best to just get back at one another and we were going into arguments thinking I'm going to win and you're going to lose. If you go into an argument thinking I'm going to win and you're going to lose, both of you are going to lose. You need to go into you need to go into disagreements thinking how can we both win? How can we both walk away as winners? How can we fix this situation in our life so that we both both walk away feeling like we've increased our uh, our marriage, we've increased our relationship. So we just begin to listen to understand. You must all be quick to listen. And I'll give you just a quick extra one. It's not in your notes. Maybe you want to write this one down. This one has always been good for me. Guard your words faithfully. Guard your words faithfully. It's extra. Proverbs 21 and 23 says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and it will keep you out of trouble. Every man in here needs to write that down and memorize it this week. Watch your words and keep your mouth shut and it will keep you out of trouble. I learned that early on. If I can just find a way not to just inject my opinion all of the time. That's not what my wife is not seeking my opinion every time we are in a disagreement or every time there's something that needs to be done in our family. We just need to learn to believe the best in one another. My iPad's talking to me. We need to learn to believe the best in one another and we listen to understand and we guard our words faithfully. So we've just learned early on that we're going to do those things. Now, number three, we're going to seek God. We're going to believe the best. And then number three, have fun. We're going to have fun. I love Ecclesiastes 9. And nine, live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. It is a gift. Everybody say this with me. Marriage is a? Come on, one more time. Marriage is a? It's a gift. A lot of people are like, I need to take that thing back. <laughs> I, need, I need to return that thing. But it's a gift from God. It is a gift from God. It is a gift. Marriage is a gift. And Solomon, he was in an unhappy place. So you can see he was kind of depressed. He said, live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days that life, uh, that God has given us under the sun. What is he saying? Life is hard. And sometimes I find, a, I find it really hard to find out what did I do with any purpose today? What happened this week that made any difference in my life or my family or my job? It's meaningless. It's meaningless. But thank God I've got 
a wife. That's basically what he's saying. Live happily with your wife through all the meaningless days. And can I say this? Marriage without fun makes life so much harder. So much. Well, life's hard already. If you're not enjoying your marriage, it's just, it just throws it that much deeper. So we, we figured out three ways. Three ways that every couple, I believe this, every couple, every marriage needs to have fun. These three ways. Number one, I'll share them with you. Number one is you need to have face-to-face fun. You need to have face-to-face fun. That's this. It's communication. You know, nowadays, the longer you're married, the, here's what you mostly communicate about. You communicate about, you communicate about schedules. What time, does, what time is football practice? Do I need to get them here at this time? What are we, what's for dinner tonight? What are we doing this week? And that becomes the kind of the, the crux of all of our communication with one another. And we forget about all of the times that we used to communicate before marriage and before life got so busy. I remember my wife and I, because we uh, started dating young, we used to talk a lot on the phone. Guys, we talked a lot on the phone. My wife used to tell me, she said, you don't have to talk, I'll just listen to you breathe. So we would, we had the landline, you know, everybody, anybody remember the landline? Teenagers, there used to be a time in our lives where we were stuck to a wall talking on the phone because we couldn't, we didn't, was no, if you were lucky, if your family had money, you had a cordless phone <laughs> and you could sneak away somewhere, but we were stuck to a wall and I remember hiding that landline because you were in trouble if you were on the phone past nine o'clock at my house. I don't know about any of you, but that's the time. We couldn't stay on the phone. So we would sneak and we would just breathe. And then every now and then mom would pick up the phone and see if we were on it and then you're done. You're just silent. You would try to, you would try to mimic the, uh, the, the dial tone. <laughs> Maybe she wouldn't figure it out that you're on the phone. <laughs> but we would just listen to it and we would talk. And we would dream, and we would talk about maybe the potential of what God's going to do in our lives. And we would talk about our, my dreams and her dreams, and we would enjoy conversation with one another. And it was always exciting talking about the potential of what was going to come after, what was going to come later in our life, and the things that God was going to be able to do through us. And many of you have memories of those conversations with your spouse. You already remember those things, but maybe those dreams, as you grew older and as time went on as marriage happened and day-to-day kind of happened some of those dreams are starting to die maybe some of those dreams are already in your heart and you go but I don't I don't think that's going to happen maybe this isn't going to happen and you find yourself talking less and less about those things and talking more and more just about the day-to-day the schedule the life that you're having to live and you forget that to talk about the potential in your marriage and the potential that God's going to do through you and in you some of you have had dreams of uh, aspirations of different jobs or different ministries that maybe God was going to do through you and your family and as time has gone on it's become more difficult for that stuff to happen and you just kind of quit talking about it some of you have had dreams of children in your life and you used to dream it you used to talk with so much excitement about the possibility of raising children and for whatever reason whatever's going on it just it's been it's it's prolonged itself and and that hasn't happened and you find yourself the things you used to be so excited about when you prayed about you're, you're you're kind of becoming negative about in your time with God and you're starting to ask God why aren't those things happening why isn't that happening? And because of that, you talk less and less about it with your spouse, and you guys don't dream anymore. You don't have face-to-face interaction anymore. You don't talk about the dreams and aspirations for God, and I would say you need to have that kind of love. You need to rekindle that kind of conversation in your marriage and begin to pray together and ask God together for those things and those dreams and those aspirations because it's fun to dream about the potential in your marriage. Another one, number two type of fun that every couple, every marriage needs to have. I call it this. My wife doesn't like it. She gets, uh, she gets weird every time I talk about it. But you need to have some belly, to, belly button to belly button love. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Belly button to belly button love. Listen to Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. It says this, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. It is it's so it's so easy. Everybody used to think I did when I first got married. I was 21 years old. I thought, boy, I'm fixing to get married, and we're gonna have sex all the time. <laughs> we're wrong, fellas. <laughs> Let me tell you, some of you aren't married yet. Don't believe the lie. <laughs> You're so excited, but I'm telling you, it's, it, it's hard. You, you, you're you so excited, you're so excited, you're so excited. You get married, and you're like, what the junk? <laughs> what, what happened? 
You need to have intimacy in your marriage. You go, well, it's not fun. Well, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you, need to, you need to learn how to enjoy your spouse. Women, you know this to be true. It is true. You say, well, he wants to have sex all the time. I know that. It's okay. Have sex. Enjoy your, enjoy your spouse. Enjoy your marriage. Have a good time. Listen, sex inside of marriage, it builds the intimacy in your marriage. It will only make your marriage last longer. Sex outside of marriage, it destroys. It will shred your life apart. It will mess you up. But I'm telling you, if you will look forward to honoring God in your marriage and you will say, you know what? I'm, we're, gonna, we're just going to enjoy life. We're going to have some fun. Read a book. If it's boring, read a book. Learn some things. Do some things different. But have some fun. Everybody say fun. All right, we'll move on. I know. <laughs> number three. Number three. You need to have some side-by-side -side fun. You need to have some side-by-side -side fun. It means enter his or her world. Go on a work trip. Man, ride bikes together. Go fishing. Play a game. Play golf. Go to the grocery store for the love of all that's holy, fellas. Go, go shopping with her once in a while. You say, you say, I'd love to have fun if she'd just come do what I wanted to do. But you never enter her world. You never do something that she likes to do. You guys need to have fun. Go hiking. Figure out a hobby that both of you like. And start enjoying time with one another. I'm convinced with everything that's in me, lots of marriages are struggling because they refuse to have fun together. They refuse to have fun. It's all about business. It's all about getting through the day-to-day -day and just making it through life, and it's hard. Guys, life is hard without fun. Start having some fun with your wife. Start having some fun with your husband. Two times when men are willing to open up. You say, I wish my husband would open up and would share more with me. There's two times that if every man will open up. It's when he's doing something that he enjoys with you and right after he's done something that he enjoys doing with you, okay? So have some fun. You're, you'll be happy you did. So we learn early on that for better or worse, whatever comes or goes, we're going to commit to have fun in our marriage. It's not always going to be down to business. We're going to be excited about life together. We're going to grow old having fun together. We're going to be the old couple when we're 75 years old we're, or 85 years old. As we get older, we're going to be that couple that has fun. We're going to weird our grandkids out. They're going, they're going to be so weirded out by the fun that we have. Why? Because we're committed. We're going to have fun. We're, going to, we're in this thing for the long haul, and we're going to enjoy life together. Come on, somebody. Y'all received that today? That's good. That's good stuff. One more. One more. I'll give you number four. Never Give up. Never give up. I love this verse, Matthew 19 and 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I believe this is the, the strongest, one of the strongest scriptures, verses in all of the Bible. You see, nowadays, marriage is just too easy. It's too easy to get into. It's too easy to get out of. We don't see marriage as a covenant. We see marriage as a contract, especially in our culture in the United States. It's so easy. You know, it's just been in the past 20 years that the, the, the number one reason that's placed on divorce papers when people divorce is irreconcilable differences. That's it. You know, that used to not even be an option. It wasn't even an option. It wasn't even on the pay. You couldn't even think about doing it. We just, we just, we just can't get along. Used to, it was hard to get out of a marriage once you were married. It was difficult to do that. And because we've started thinking of marriage as more of a contract and less of a covenant. And those are two very different things. You see, a contract is based on mutual distrust. It means this, I don't trust you and you really don't trust me. So if you don't keep your end of the bargain, I'm, I don't have to keep my end of the bargain. And we got a contract that says that. But see, a covenant says this, it's based on mutual a covenant is based on mutual commitment. It means this, I'm committed to you. I make a covenant that says this, you're going to mess up, you're going to let me down, I'm going to be disappointed in you, but no matter what, I'm committed. This is my covenant. That's what God did. You know, you know that marriage, some, a lot of people don't know this, scripturally, marriage is the exact replication of the gospel on this earth. God could have chosen anything in the world to, 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 rep, to, to teach us about his love for us. 
could have chosen anything, all the kind of stuff that we can think of that God could have used to teach us about his love for us. And he chose marriage. He chose a husband and a wife. And he chose the covenant relationship between us and him. He chose that to be the representation of the gospel on this earth. In the very beginning of time, we see where God made a covenant with his people. And he said, you know what? I know they're going to mess up. And I know they're going to fail. And over and time and time and time again, they're going to let me down. But this is my covenant with you. You see, you can stamp out a contract. You can rip it up, shred it up, and it can be over. You can disagree on a contract, and as long as both parties of the contract are fulfilled, it's over and you can move on with your life. But you can't stamp out a covenant. You can't undo blood. (laughs) You can't undo it. You can't undo uh, when you, when God, the very first covenant God made with man, he killed an animal and shed blood. And you can't undo that. That's not undoable. He said, for better or worse, this is my covenant to you. I love you. And that's the same difference we make in marriage. And I just want to encourage you. Many of you are here today. Maybe you're in a marriage relationship that is just stuck. And maybe you've gone through this season of your life where you know what? I'm done. I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to quit. I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. And two, two most, most uh, popular reasons for divorce in the United States, money and sex. Number one is money. More people divorce over money because they can't, they can't get on the same page financially than any other reason. The other, number two, is because of sexual reasons, sexual sin in the marriage or whatever. And so many people are at that point, and they just can't get together. They can't figure it out. And they get to the point in their life where they finally just say, I'm done. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of being the only one that cares. You know, my wife and I make a commitment at the first of every year. We kind of pray together through January, and every year we kind of come together and we think of a word that we're going to work on together all year long. And this year, our word was order. Some of you know us personally, and you know that we're not very organized people. <laughs> we don't always get the best. We, we look organized when, fam- when people come to the house. But if you come unannounced, you'll know how unorganized we are because this doesn't look great all the time. We're not always in order, and we just decided that we were going to work on that this year. We're going to get our finances in order. We're going to keep our house, our home in order. We're going to keep our daughter. We're going to make sure that we model order in front of her so that she can learn principles like that. So we just decided that we were going to do that. Every month, every month, we go back to that word and we go, I remember starting in January going, all right, this is our word. And then February came along. I said, this is our word. We're working on order. Why aren't we working on order? We need to get it together. And then May came along, and we said, we're working on order. We need to get things in order. Our home is not in order. Our house is in order. Our finances, we need to get it all in order. And then July came, and we're doing the same thing. We're fighting over order, and we're fighting for our marriage. But you know what? We've committed to believe the best in one another, and we just realized we're not going to give up. So you know what's happened? Slowly but surely, we're almost over. The year is almost gone, and we are starting to see some order in our life. We're starting to see some order in our finances. We're starting to see some order in our vehicles. Praise the Lord. We're starting to see some order in our home. We're starting to see. We're starting to see. Why? Because we committed to fight. We committed to fight together. We committed that we weren't going to give up and we weren't going to quit. And guys, that happens in any avenue of your life. You may be stuck in a marriage where your husband or your wife has been, maybe your wife is, uh, is, a, is a, just a continual spender and she's racked up thousands and thousands of dollars in debt and you don't know what you're going to do and you say, man, we're ruined. We don't know what to do. I just, can, I just tell you, you just need to continue to fight. You just need to continue to work toward re, uh, working that thing out and getting some order in your finances. Maybe you're in a marriage you, your husband's been, uh, been addicted to pornography or sexual sin for years and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to get out of it and you're stuck I would just, listen, fight for it fight for your marriage fight for your relationship it's worth it guys it is worth it it is the representation of the gospel on this earth and it is worth anything that you need to do Pastor Brandon said it weeks ago you need to get desperate and you need to get committed to saying God whatever you want Whatever you do, man, we're going to serve you. We're not giving up on one another. Maybe you're here today and you say, man, that's us. Man, we're struggling. Our marriage is stuck. We need some help. I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you today that today, if you would take you and your spouse, if you would commit to seeking God first, 
If you'll do that, if you'll pray together and you'll believe the best in one another and you'll start having a little fun, you don't take life so serious and then you won't give up, I'm telling you, you're, you're, you'll, you'll start changing the direction and the course of your marriage and you'll start seeing changes and God will start doing things in your life like you've never known before. You're not married, maybe you're looking for marriage. If you'll practice these principles, if you'll start earn, learning and realizing God's word is alive and breathing and there is a way to do relationships that honor him and that work. If you'll do it God's way, I'm telling you, you'll be more fulfilled in your life. Marriage won't be perfect. You'll let each other down. It won't always be great, but I'm telling you, you'll be happy. You'll be fulfilled and God will be at the head of your marriage and you'll You'll know that you're living your life on purpose for him. I'm going to pray with you this morning. If you'll just bow your heads, close your eyes. Our worship team's going to come, and they're going to play some music. Maybe you're here this morning, and you say, Pastor Brandon, that's, that's all great. I want to not give up. I want to love my spouse, and I want to seek God, but I can't really seek God. I don't even have a relationship with God. Just to be blatantly honest, I, I, I've been doing this thing by myself. And today, you're saying that God's covenant with me is that he loved me enough that no matter what sin I've committed, absolutely, there's not anything you could have done in your life that God right now, today, isn't prepared to forgive you of, to wipe the slate clean. You say, I don't have a relationship with God, and today I'd like to start that. I'm fixing to lead you in a prayer commitment of prayer of salvation to Jesus making him number one in your life that's the best decision you could ever make for you personally it's the best decision you could ever make for your family for your spouse for your children for them to see you live a life that honors God first and you say Brandon that's me I want to live my life on purpose for him I need a relationship with him and when you pray count me in on that this morning just slip your hand up and put it down come on I see that hand and that one and that one that one all over this house I'm ready to live a life that honors him. I'm ready to stop doing it by myself. Maybe you're here today and you say, man, we're, we're committed to God, but I'll be honest with you, we're stuck. Our marriage is struggling and we're going through lots of stuff and we really didn't know a way out and we've, we've really struggled through that. And I want to pray with you this morning. You don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do this by yourself. God's got, God's got answers in his word. God's got people that love you and want to see God's best in you. And I'm telling you, if you'll commit your marriage, if you'll hand it over to him, he'll do things in your life and in your marriage like you never knew possible. You say, man, this is, I've, I've, I've messed it up time and time again. This is my third marriage or fourth marriage or I'm just off of a marriage and I, I, I don't know what to do. You know, it's all level at the cross. The Bible says there's not a thing you could have done that God cannot redeem. And we're just, we're just letting you know today that he is the great redeemer. He can redeem your marriage. He can redeem your relationships. Every sin that you've ever committed, he buys it back with the blood of Jesus. And today, you just want to know, man, I just need to, I need to recommit. I need to refocus our marriage. We need to refocus our life, and we're going to start chasing after him today. That's you. Just slip your hand up. I'll, I'm going to pray for you. Come on. Hands all over the place. I see those. Father, we love you today. We celebrate your work on the cross, Jesus. Thank you that that we're not hopeless today. God, all of the hands, God, there was nine or ten hands that just went up and said, I need to commit my life to Jesus. I need to start living a life that honors him, and I'm ready to walk out of here with a fresh, clean slate. Your word says, God, that he that is in Christ is a new creation. All old things are passed away. And Father, as right now as we sit in this room and we just begin to confess our sins to you, God, we just confess that we are wrong and you are right. God, that there is nothing good inside of us apart from your son Jesus, and we just accept him today as our Savior. We commit to start living a life on purpose for you, God. Your plan, not mine. Your will, not mine. For me, for my family, for my kids, for my life, God, I trust you. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiveness. Thank you for salvation. Father, we just love you today. And God, for all of the hands that went up and said, we just need to recommit our family. We're stuck. We need to start doing things differently. We're going to commit to chase God together. And we're not going to go get so serious about life. And we're going to learn to start chasing our dreams with one another together. And we're going to have fun together and we're not going to give up on one another. Father, I pray that you would just give them a fresh infusion of your love and your mercy and your grace, that they would walk out of here with a new encouragement today for their family and for their lives. Jesus, we love you. Thank you 
for your provision. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. We celebrate you today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, church. Can we celebrate? Man, we had some hands. People submit their life to Jesus. That's awesome. Yeah.